again. Uh, we have a really exciting panel uh, this afternoon. Um, so again, for people who are here this morning, my name is Sylvia Brody. I'm the Executive Director of Toxics Action Center. I uh, live and work here in Boston and oversee our six New England offices. And um, I, before we actually dive into this panel, I want to do something I didn't do today and um, just give an enormous thanks to Bill Brown and Northeastern University and the Social Science Environmental Health Center. I'm certainly also really grateful to our co-hosts, uh, you know, the other co-hosts as well, at Silent Spring Institute and Testing for Peace, who also played an enormous role in pulling today together, and, um, and in supporting work that community groups are doing here in New England and across the country to tackle these issues. Um, so, um, and so the purpose of this panel, this is one of two panels that we have planned, uh, between today and tomorrow that really has a goal of digging into the personal experiences of impacted communities. So we, we really wanted to convey the breadth and pervasiveness of the PFAS water contamination threat, um, including impacts on communities all across the country and the varied experiences of those communities. And, um, and I think it's, you know, from talking with community leaders uh, from all across the country, it's really clear that um, there's a need to ensure that, um, you know, that experts who have resources to bring to bear in these campaigns really have, and the regulators as well, um, and even the corporations responsible for the contamination or other responsible parties really understand the experiences that communities are going through. And, um, you know, I recognize that people here in the room probably are doing community engaged work in many cases and probably have a basic understanding of these issues, but we have six um, tremendous uh, community leaders here from uh, from three different communities. That's right. Um, four different communities. Sorry, here um, who are going to help us um, sort through some of the politics and implications of this public health crisis. And today's panel is actually focused on um, contamination from military sites in particular and airports. So, um, which I, I just I see as very different in many ways. You know, certainly there's similarities, but also very different in many ways from, um, you know, taking on large corporations like Dupont. Because in this case, um, the responsible party um, that you know we need to take action is our very own government. Um, so, um, so, uh, so I'm really excited to actually introduce these panelists. I'll give a really brief introduction, and then I'd ask each of them to prepare um, around an eight-minute uh, opening to brief this room of people on their, the basics of their campaign, so they'll talk through how the PFAS was discovered, how they found out, what the community response was like, and the response of the authorities, um, their goals, both long-term and short-term, and, and what's been working for them to date, and what their greatest needs are and challenges. And then, um, and then we'll actually, um, I'll actually see some really specific questions for discussion after that. So we'll have this opening, um, providing some just basic background of the campaigns. Then I'll see some specific questions, and then we'll actually have time at the end for Q and A uh, from the audience uh, before we have some parting messages for the room. So that's the plan for how this is going to run. And so I want to actually introduce everyone, and then I'll I'll bring Andrea back up to. Um, to give the first presentation. Uh, so uh, speaking on the panel today, we have Andrea Miko, co-founder of Testing for Peace, the community action group advocating for answers and action for the peace community impacted by PFAS contamination at the former Peace Air Force Base in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And after learning that her husband and children had been impacted by highly contaminated drinking water at the Peace Trade Park, she got in this group. Um, we also have Cindy Ashbeck and Aaron Weed, both hailing from uh, Michigan, from Wordsmith, where um, Cindy is a co-founder of the Veterans and Civilians Clean Water Alliance, a community action group advocating for action and answers in response to contamination at the former Wordsmith, Michigan Air Force Base. Cindy and her husband spent six years of their military career at Wordsmith, along with ha you know, having three children who were also impacted by the contamination. Aaron is also from Minnesota, Michigan, and served 22 years in the Air Force, and is currently the township supervisor, and has been really engaged in, um, in these cleanup efforts as well. We also have Hope Gross and Joanne Stanton, who both grew up near the Warminster Naval Air Force Base, a national priority list Superfund site. Hope and her family 
have been personally impacted by cancer, and she's working to both address PFAS contamination at the site as well as the other 75 harmful chemicals found on site. Um, and Joanne has focused her activism on children's environmental health, uh, inspired by her son's uh, experience with brain cancer <laughs> diagnosis, and has co-authored a book that's being published this year called Behind Closed Doors, <coughs> The Practices Harming Our Children's Health and What We Can Do About It. Um, and then we also have Susan Gordon, who is an organic farmer from Colorado Springs, Colorado. She and her family, including her husband and two daughters, and their farm are, are impacted by high levels of PFAS from firefighting foam used at the nearby Peterson Air Force Base, detected in the aquifer that feeds the farm as well. So we'll hear from all uh, six of these amazing leaders, um, and I want to invite Andrea to come up uh, to share some background on her story. Everyone. Sylvia, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. My name is Andrea Miko. Um, I just want to say I'm blown away by everybody in this room and that everyone's here. It's like a dream of mine to see all of you, so thank you for being here. Um, I only have eight minutes, so I'm going to talk really fast. Uh, I represent the Peace Community, which um, is located in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, so we'll get going. Testing for Peas, we're a community action group made up of myself, Elena Davis, and Michelle Dalton. I'm not sure who Michelle is, but um, here's a picture of the three of us. Uh, our mission is to be a reliable resource for education and communication while advocating for a long-term health plan on behalf of those impacted by PFAS contamination at um, the Peas Trade Port and the former Peas Air Force Base. Kind of a run through of what we're going to discuss. Why did we form? In May of 2014, we learned in a local newspaper article that the Peace Trade Port was impacted by PFAS contamination. There's three wells that supply the Peace Trade Port, and the Haven Well, which supplied about half of the water, uh, tested very, very high for um, PFAS. And so, as community members, we were concerned. Um, my children and my husband, uh, my husband worked at Peas, and my children attended daycare. Elena and Michelle also had worked at Peace and had children at daycare as well, so we were personally impacted through our families. A little bit about Peace. So it was at an Air Force Base from 1956 to 1991. Um, it's a pretty large area, about 4,300 acres of land. Um, and in 1991, it did close under the BRAC. Uh, so it was actually one of the one of it is the first base that closed under BRAC, base realignment or draft. Um, in 1991, it was classified as Superfund site. Most people in this room know that it's, um, you know, the definition by the EPA is a candidate for a cleanup because it poses a risk to human health or the environment. And there were 41 hazardous uh, sites identified on Peace. So Peace is now a trade port. This is something that's kind of unique to our situation. A lot of people that don't know know the area don't quite understand what a trade port is. I like to say that it's a large industrial park, so people don't actually live on Peace anymore, but it's home to about 250 businesses. It's actually a very beautiful place, tree-lined, um, very nice place to go and look and see. Um, there's two large daycare centers, restaurants, healthcare establishments, a couple colleges, golf course. Uh, there's still an airport at Peace and about um, 9,500 to 10,000 people a day visit Peas for work or business. And that is how my husband was working for a company on Peas and we sent our children to daycare on Peas, so that's how they became exposed. So like I said before, Peas has three wells that supply its drinking water. There's the Haven Well, Smith and Harrison. Uh, Haven Well is about 46% and that was the one that was the most contaminated. I'll get into those levels, just so you have an understanding. Um, just like everyone else here on, on, on this panel, uh, Peace was contaminated by um, using AFFF when it was an active base. They started using it in the 1970s, and there were 21 areas identified um, on Peace where AFFF was stored or released. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this slide before, but to me this is really impactful. It says, as of 2014, 664 fire crashing sites identified by the DOD or AFFF laced with PFCs was used in the U.S. So um, Pease was one of the first communities to discover this contamination at a military site, but we have since learned that we are not alone um, and that there are many, many others, and I think there are more to come. Um, so this year, this is the, um, a lot of people ask, what were the levels in your wells? I feel like it's kind of a competition between some of the communities. <laughs> what levels were yours? 
who you are. So, um, so we we um, got on the map for our PFOS, which was found at the Haven Well at 2,500 parts per trillion. This is in April of 2014. Uh, PFOA was 350 at the time. The Provisional Health Advisory was 400. So we heard a lot of people initially say, you don't have a PFOA issue in your community. You just have a PFOS issue. Um, and then we didn't understand uh, PFHXS, that wasn't even on our radar um, when we first found our contamination, that was 830. But most people focused on the PFOS because it was above the 200 uh, parts per trillion of the Federal Health Advisory by the EPA at that time. Um, and then in the other wells that supply drinking water, you can see the Smith and Harrison, uh, yeah, Smith and Harrison well, they had lower levels, um, about under 50 parts per trillion. <laughs> So a quick timeline of events. So in 2014 is when we learned about our uh, contamination. Um, they tested for the water the first time in April 2014. A um, newspaper article hit, and that's how I learned of the contamination and became very concerned and started advocating to my state health department for blood testing for my family. I was very concerned after I researched. When I first learned that they were calling it PSCs, I didn't even know what those were. But when I started researching them, I became very concerned about them bioaccumulating, and I had read some information on the C8 health study, and that concerned me that my children were exposed at a very early age in their life. Um, I didn't get a whole lot of action for several months from my state health department, um, and it really took me going to the media. I know we've talked a lot about how important the media is. So it took, in January of 2015, me calling my local newspaper and just hoping they would take a chance and run a story, and this was a front page story in January 2015, and that was really the catalyst that really got people paying attention. I think it really embarrassed a lot of people that they had let several months, several months go by with no action. Um, in 2015, our governor in New Hampshire opened a blood testing program to anyone at peace that drank the water. In 2015, we had two rounds of blood testing where almost um, 1,200 people participated in, um, no, I'm sorry, it was more like 1,600 people participated in blood testing. Uh, and we found, it was then in June of 2015 that our initial run of blood tests showed that we had a very high level of PFHXS in our blood. So that was the first time people were concerned about what, what is that PFC? We've only been hearing about the PFOS. You know, what, what is this one? We're kind of concerned. Um, and then also um, in July of that year, the EPA placed a very strict order on the Air Force to clean up the Haven Well, which, like I said, supplied about 50% of the water and had been shut down. So there really hadn't been a whole lot of action in terms of remediating, remediating that well until the EPA placed the order. Um, some more time in 2015, um, that's when our community met with the Air Force to talk about cleaning up the wells, to talk about our elevated blood levels and what was going to happen. And that's really when the Air Force referred us to ATSDR. They were very quick to say, you know, we're not federal health experts here. We can't answer any of your health-related questions or concerns. We're going to refer you to the people that, that can help. So that's how our community became officially plugged in with ATSDR. Um, and we met with ATSDR for the first time back in October. In 2016, ATSDR came into our community and recruited a CAP, a Community Assistance Panel. Some of you might be familiar with that model. They use that at Camp Lejeune, um, and it's been very successful. Um, so we formed a CAP in 2016. The Air Force also formed a RAB, a Restoration Advisory Board. So really those two groups, the CAP really focuses on the health concerns, the health questions of the community, and um, the RAB really focuses on the cleanup of the wells and environmental restoration. Um, in 2016, we got our final blood test results back from 2015 that did show we had st statistically significantly elevated blood levels compared to national average. Uh, we had blood testing reopened for our community. Um, and the Air Force also put in large GAC filters on um, the two smaller LZPs, um, and they're still in design for the Haven Well, which remains closed to this day. And this year, we've had multiple um, bills from one of our state reps, Mindy Mesmer, who's really been focusing on decreasing the levels for PFCs in New Hampshire. We have adopted, um, sorry, my time is up. I'm going to go really fast. So New Hampshire has adopted seven and um, we do want it more. So um, we had, some of you, I can follow anything. We had a feasibility assessment released by ATSDR. Um, in May of this year that did propose different health studies and unfortunately we learned a couple weeks ago that the Air Force said they do not have the authority to fund those studies. We are absolutely not taking no for an answer and we continue to fight and that is um, our current focus right now is really pushing not only for a study at peace but something more on a national level as well, including all these other communities that are impacted. So 
Real quick, I know uh, Dr. Birnbaum actually had a slide similar to this. This is our blood levels compared to the national average pieces in pink. So as you can see, we did have elevated levels, the PFH PFHXS being the highest. That's most concerning to our community. It's a half-life of seven to nine years. It's the highest in our blood, and there's the least amount of health data on it. So that's very alarming to us. Um, this is just a little bit more detail of where I got that information and data. So we work with multiple agencies, as you can see, so this is definitely a multi-agency approach. We've had many accomplishments since 2014 with blood testing, getting our wells treated, being connected with ATSDR, and now working towards a, um, you know, a national and a, and a local health study. Um, we have a lot of challenges, just like these other communities. You know, we want lower standards for PFAS and drinking water. We don't want to drink any of them in our water. We feel that sometimes health effects are minimized or downplayed by government agencies, um, and sometimes communication to the community can be inconsistent. I promise you I'm almost getting done. Um, and then we have other concerns in our area. So um, in the seacoast part of New Hampshire where we live, they have identified a pediatric cancer cluster, two rare pediatric cancers. Um, there's also a Kobe landfill, which is the next town over from Pease, that we know the Air Force dumped at. They have found high levels of PFAS out of, out of um, surface water and groundwater there. So just wondering how all this is connected, how it's all tying together. Um, and there's um, several communities in New Hampshire that are now dealing with PFAS exposure. We just learned of two more last week where they found um, elevated levels. We have lots of ongoing efforts. Um, really, we want a health study for our community. We want to collaborate with other communities. And we want lower standards. And I believe I am done. And so I just want to end with this quote. This is Elaine, I credit Elaine Davis, and she always highlights this quote. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I think that's incredibly appropriate here today. And I want to thank you all for being here and listening. I know there's something really unfair about asking someone to distill the last few years of their life into eight minutes. So, um, I'm going to continue, I think I'm going to continue to, to be kind of as strict as I can be about the time. I don't want to cut people off when they're in the middle of the story, but um, I do want to invite up Hope and Joanne who will share the story of their work in Warminster. Uh, and, um, and so I'll continue to keep time, uh, and uh, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for all of these rich stories. It's frozen, so we're just going to wing it. <laughs> 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 
I don't have anyone here. Um, let me look at. Okay. Uh, Warmester is a town of about 32,000 people. Uh, we're about five miles north of Philadelphia. We have 18 public supply wells. What makes um, our town a little bit different is we have uh, a lot of fractured bedrock. So it's a complex water distribution system that's set up. Um, and we have our. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> ground water is the sole source of water in our community and actually all the neighboring communities so that's really the root of the problem so Warminster Naval Air Base is about 840 acres a field in the high time when it was opened, and about 3,200 employees, 200 of them being military, 2,000 or 3,000 um, civilians. Um, they operated from World War II to about 1996. There was also two housing facilities on the base area that housed about 500 military uh, families. They. Um, the waste was burned and buried at the site, and by 1979, the EPA was brought in to investigate contamination on the site. Our first um, problems with water, at least in Warminster, uh, our public drinking water was contaminated with high levels of VOCs and also some heavy metals in the late 1970s. Um, this is also about the time that our community started to notice, or at least, you know, observationally, that a lot of people were getting sick. There were a lot of cancers. On my street alone, we lost seven different young, uh, young people in their 30s and 40s, my friends' moms, that all died of cancer. And at that time, and it was in the late 1970s, early 1980s, this was way above what the uh, incidence rate for cancer should have been. Uh, about three miles down the road, we have uh, another trio of military sites. Uh, we're just going to refer to it as the Willow Grove area. There are uh, the national, the, the Navy, the National Guard, and the Air Force all operate out of the same location. And the same types of activities that take place right down the road in Warminster are also taking place three miles down the road at the Willow Grove site. Um, there's about 300 residents that lived on base, there was a daycare center, and there's about 2,000 civilians and military personnel daily on that base. They have two supply wells, and uh, by 1995, the Willow Grove site was already uh, on the national priority list as a super fun site. So by 1989, Warminster was named on the Superfund site. Um, at Warminster, there was over 50 plus different chemicals, heavy metals, polluting the water and the soil. We had eight separate waste sites that were identified um, on the Warminster site. Um, it was closed under Brock in 1996, and after that, the majority of the land was transferred to, to be um, turned over for parks soccer fields, um, 55 and older community, and also a, um, a wellness center for cancer patients, how ironic. <laughs> right in the backyard was PFOAs, Health to Cancer Wellness Center. In 2011 and 2012, we found out one year earlier than the rest of the country that we had a problem because the, the Navy needed to do their five-year remediation review of Warminster. A year later, when the municipalities had to check for these chemicals, eight of the public water, drinking water wells were shut down. And the EPA levels back then were between, as we talked about, 200 and 400. So these eight public drinking um, wells were shut down with those levels. Um, 
Um, obviously, the sources of PFOA and contamination are believed to be firefighting activities at both sites since the 1970s. This map um, shows my house, actually the little house that you see up there. Um, the number eight is the PFOA site that still is not clean. They aren't able to build on it. The actual trenches are still on the site. You can walk it. Um, the fences still exist. Um, the X's are the other sites that were high contamination um, areas on the site. I could literally throw a rock to Section 8. We watched the planes burn. We watched them get put out with foam. We inhaled the fumes. And then we climbed the fence and we played in the plane as a child. I lived there from the time I was one until I was 25, until I had cancer. I was diagnosed with stage four melanoma cancer. Um, primarily, I believe, was from TCE and the other chemicals, not to mention PFOA, which we didn't even know about. Well, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. This is what we did for fun in Warminster. Uh, this was 1982, and I'm sure the Navy would like to take this picture back. It was published <laughs> in their newsletter. Obviously, the contamination just continues to expand. Um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that the groundwater system that's set up. Um, and also, we believe that there are businesses in the area who are also using PFAS. Okay, how has this impacted our local drinking water? It has contaminated the drinking water of more than 100,000 people. 22 public drinking water wells have been shut down. Over 200 private drinking water wells have been shut down. We were exposed to PFOA and PFOS levels up to 15 times the EPA's lifetime health advisory. And we have not had any blood monitoring done whatsoever, but there was one local person who did um, release it into the news, and he had a PFOA level of 31 parts per trillion, which is 15 times the national average. For our particular area, PFOS is, is much, uh, is, is where our, our greatest concern is. However, our Warmester's highest public water PFOA level was 350 parts per trillion. We have the third highest public water PFOS level in the U.S. at 1,100 parts per trillion. At Willow Grove, the on-site water supply well tested PFOS at more than 240 times the EPA's lifetime health advisory. I actually had to call the EPA three times just to double check that the number was right. Uh, 19,000 parts per trillion. And this had a base. This had you know, families living there. There was a daycare center there. So over the years, you know, and, and we did how many years was this operating before we even knew about it? The area generally has recorded among the highest public drinking water levels for PFOA and PFOS combined at 1290 parts per trillion and all three area water utilities are among the top 10 utilities with the highest PFHXS and PFOS combined levels ever sampled in the U.S. And this is just a chart from Warminster Water Authority basically just stating the PFCs detected and the dates. Uh, the military response, um, the things, these are the things that the military did do. Uh, the biggest thing that they did was um, pay for an installation of um, the carbon filtration systems on public wells and provide the public wells that were um, over the EPA level for the PFOA, which was level was. But, so that's the biggest thing that the actual Navy did for us. Um, the local water authority, um, in a nutshell, basically has had to purchase 1.2 million gallons per day of water. Um, all of the, there's three water utilities that are uh, involved in the contamination at this point. And over time, as the EPA's level dropped, more wells got shut down, and at this point, um, we're buying our water from another local water utility. In the meantime, we're trying to figure out what's going on with the whole underground distribution system, trying to put carbon filters on, trying to figure out who's paying for what. Um, and they, so basically we're buying our water at this point. Um, 
and the authorities have said that once they hopefully are able to use the water, that they will guarantee that it is about at the one part per trillion. Our media has been excellent. Our media is the, the he's not here right now, Kyle. Um, he's supposed to speak tomorrow, but his counterpart will be doing the talk instead. Um, media is huge. He has done an incredible job informing the public. He's also an investigator. Um, he's investigating the extent and the impact of the problem. And that's his logo on well water that we stole for the whole PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> um, community responses. In the beginning, when, um, all the, when Kyle brought this all out in the news media, there were meetings, rallies, the Navy would show up at meetings, attorneys would show up, and currently, basically, the community remain, efforts remain pretty much shattered. Um, Joanne and I are active, but that's about it. That's all like, we see active right, the, right now. The uh, political, um, we've got poor political response. Um, Joanne and I have asked for health studies. We've met with politicians, <coughs> and we've been shut down. We, we're not giving up. We, we're not giving up. We even asked them to come to this, and nobody responds. Um, legal responses. Uh, the individual and class action suits filed against phone manufacturers. That's basically what's been going on. The ATSDR did do a cancer review study. It was just on select zip codes. Of course, we don't believe it really captured much of anything. Um, it said that there was not a cancer cluster study, but you beg to differ. Uh, there were high levels of the certain cancers that you would assume to be associated that did show up at a higher incidence level. Um, there's been several health studies over the years that really have showed not much. And that's the timer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Great. So thank you so much. And thanks everyone for bearing with us on the technological challenges we're having around the PowerPoint presentation. I want to invite Susan up to talk a little bit about her experience in Colorado. Um, and then we'll hear from our final community, uh, impacted community, and then we'll actually take some time to have them uh, to where I plan to talk through with them some specific questions, um, some follow-up questions to discuss. Thanks. I brought some clean Colorado water. <laughs> <laughs> now you actually, you'll know I'm not from the East Coast because I want to say water. <laughs> uh, I'm Susan Gordon. Um, I am an organic farmer. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, I do not know how to use PowerPoints. I don't know how to make them, but somehow I pulled this together. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrea, for getting me into this. Thank you for coming. <laughs> um, Colorado, I think, is way behind the curve on this. Um, and I think it, 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 thank you to all of you for all the hard work you've done, because I think it's finally trickling in to the, to the center. And I mean, because most of the responses I got as I scrambled to get more information when this first hit the news in January of 2016, um, basically, no, we don't have enough information. We don't have enough information. We don't have enough information. It all depends on your level of exposure. No, there's more that we don't know than we do know. So to come here and hear the things that we do know makes me want to go back and really start fighting harder. So thank you all for your persistence and hard work. Um, as I said, I'm an organic farmer. I farm Benichichi Farm, which is a 190 acre um, diverse farm. And I manage it with my husband, Patrick, and I have two daughters. We've lived there for 10 years. And this farm is a very important farm to the community. It's a pretty much, it's a historic farm. Uh, with, with, been there since 1862, and um, in the early 2000s, the Benetucci family, they wanted to preserve it as a farm for the community, so they put a conservation easement on it, and um, then gifted it to a community foundation, and we've been farming it ever since, so in addition to growing, which we hope is clean food, um, we provide a lot, of, a lot of educational opportunities, and so we have thousands of visitors annually to the farm. So um, there's been, I think, 
what's probably created the most uh, reaction um, from all the regulatory agencies and politicians has been the media, and we've given a lot of accolades to the media, and I need to just say that because for um, the media to criticize the military in Colorado Springs is a huge thing. Who's been to Colorado Springs? Okay, so it's, it's there's four, at least four military installations there, so it's, it's very much a military culture, and everyone is extremely hesitant to, you know, bite the hand that feeds them. Um, so back to the farm. This, so this newspaper article appeared in September. This was, we're nine months into it now. There had been stories all along. And um, this really was heartbreaking for me to see it characterized like this because it really is a beautiful, very important farm, the last remaining farm in the region. And um, I just wanted, I think it's frozen. Wait, oh, there we go. I just want to um, quickly show you some pictures of that kind of to give you a sense of the range of um, the diversity of the activity that goes on there. It really is a wonderful place. Not only do we try to grow foods, we try to grow mines, get people thinking about healthy food, what it takes to grow it, um, and have all kinds of educational programs, uh, great bird hikes. So, you know, we really hope that the sun is not setting on this farm for the last time because that would be a terrible shame. But um, it does kind of sit at the epicenter, as this slide shows. So the yellow part is the, the area of investigation. You can see the Peterson Air Force boat base, base is just northwest of all these communities that, were in, that are impacted. It's also slightly uphill. Um, so the contaminant makes its way into the aquifer two ways, underground infiltration, as well as through the Colorado Springs sewer system. So a, lot, a lot of it's flushed right into the system and then it makes its way into Fountain Creek, which is a recharge for um, the aquifer. So this is just shows again, it's kind of a repeat of that, that the, the three, it's a total population of about 80,000 80, people that have been uh, impacted between security, wide field, fountain, and then there's another um, Stratton Meadows neighborhood. And it's interesting to note that of these areas, only one is actually a city, and that's fountain. Um, I'm going to speed up just to give you a sense of some of the levels. Whoops, I'm not going to back up, but I want to say that. Initially, they were just you know just PFOS and PFOA. The one thing our state did, they they added the PFHPA. I don't know why I haven't really heard much discussion of that. They also are ignoring the XS, which tests high everywhere. So Peterson, three, 1,300 acres, home to a lot of big players in the military, 18,000 total personnel. They trained with this stuff since the 70s. Um, their response, of course, initially was denial, then they did their own studies, they couldn't deny it anymore. One of their first public statements was, hey, we're a good neighbor, we're going to put $4.3 million towards some rapid response remediation, which allowed them to buy some bottled water, put in some filters, um, they funded some research, uh, filtration research at School of Mines. Um, at the farm, we. I, you know, I, we really have been the squeaky wheel because I wanted to know is this stuff in the food that I'm providing to people. Um, so I was scrambling. Anytime I saw a name in the paper, Dr. Chris Higgins, Dr. Mike Van Dyke, I was on the phone. You know, I didn't get the answers I want from the Air Force rep. I, Susan Bill Bray in Texas, I was calling her saying, I need your help. You know, we need information. We need to know what this stuff is, what it's doing. We did. Because we're owned by a foundation, we had the money to do additional testing. We sent samples, water, soil, vegetables, meat, eggs to Axis, Colorado School of Mines, and University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, both very helpful. So the farm kind of has become a little bit of a lab, I guess I'd say. Um, the, the board of the foundation in July of 2016 decided to stop all sale produce. That was huge for us. 
result in a huge loss of revenue and just kind of put this dark cloud over the farm and it's still like we're still kind of in a state of limbo we at the farm just had blood testing of course the state department said they were discouraging any blood testing but the foundation wanted us to get our blood tested and most recently the air force did install a GAC but there's some debate over okay is it working what are we using to what criteria is it just PFO or PFOS and I've been calling the air force trying to get that answer on that because the recent study by Chris Higgins saying that you know the GAC isn't really that good um, state county health departments they offered the testing to all the private road users um, but their money the money is ran out that's all I'm about that. There's really, really nothing to say about what the elected officials have done. <laughs> Pretty much zero. Um, and this, uh, so the, all the water districts are using a combination now of surface. Well, now some have gone to 100% surface, which is significant because surface water in Colorado is like three to four times groundwater. So this, the, white, the aquifer is an important source of water for these communities and for the farm. Um, I just want to close um, with one. I, I heard somebody say that we are terribly under-resourced in environmental science, and I agree with that. And I, and from my point of view in Colorado Springs, I feel like we are terribly over-resourced in the war preparation department. <laughs> 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 I would like to see a shift some of those resources. Every time one of those plane flies over the farm, which is multiple times a day, you know, that, I think that's another million dollars that could go towards solving this problem. So, thank you. Thank you, Susan. And apparently, if you um, aren't very skilled at putting together PowerPoints, you should get in touch with Andrea. She's not very Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, so, um, so finally, we have Aaron and Cindy who both have two different perspectives on um, the same local issue, and so um, they're going to speak s separately, um, and we'll <coughs> give them each about six minutes, and then we'll move into the discussion, uh, we'll move into the discussion section. Uh -oh. I'm Aaron Weed. I am the uh, township super and, uh, supervisor for Oscoda Township in northern Michigan. Um, it's about the same thing as a town mayor. Um, but uh, for those of you who don't have townships in your states, um, it's, a, it's a subdivision of a county. <coughs> um, so Wordsmith Air Force Base is... Um, was there it was closed down in 1993 so of course during that time that they were operational they did a lot of firefighter training but in regards to our township we're a very rural community we have about 7,000 residents um, the, play, the area is a history of logging fishing hunting tourism um, the Asano River and the Pine River watershed flows through this along with our subsequent our, our adjacent township of Asaba so both these townships are affected by this um, which totals for about 10,000 residents. And we share our local economy because our economic corridors are connected. Wordsmith uh, was primarily a bomber and refueling base. They had about 3,000 military personnel, 2,000 civilians, plus the spouses and young dependents uh, they had with them. On Wordsmith, there were two wells um, that fed their own municipal system. It did not extend out into the regular populace. It was just confined to Wordsmith. Those two wells were located directly within TCE, or chlorinated cleaner contaminants and uh, fuel contaminants. The Air Force, when they found out about it, they kind of hem hawed around about it. Eventually, they finally abandoned those two wells and they sunk another well free of those contaminants, unknowingly sunk it right in the middle of a PFAS pool. So they fed people that for quite a while. Um, but our contamination plume, and this map here shows you, uh, this is actually an earlier map, the, the plumes are now found to be much further than this and extending a little further south also. 
Uh, so, let's see here. We've got uh, also two separate plumes. Everything there is emanating from the base, and then there's a lower yellow spot that's right where a school is at, and that's where a force fire was, and the Air Force came to help fight that. Wonderful of them. And then above that is another yellow one in the Colbeck neighborhood. Same situation there. But in this case, the Air Force will not claim that top and bottom plume. So in this whole plume area, the mixed soup of all this uh, volatiles, chlorinated cleaners, PFAS, um, and this PFAS has the unique signature for AFFF. Um, there's been aircraft crashes, there's been um, inadvertent uh, hangar fire suppression systems that have gone off. Um, there's, of course, the fire training. The southern area there, where it's a real dark purple, where the blacks are, that's the hot spot. That's where they did a lot of the fire training. That's where portions of the crash plume flow down into. And that flows right into an area called Clark's Marsh, and that is a super hot area. Um, so the Air Force had implemented filtration systems throughout this area um, for the previous contaminants. And then at one point, uh, the DEQ and the EPA said, you know what, you're good to go, we're kind of hands off on this, but continue pumping. So they've been pumping this groundwater up. It's got the PFAS contamination in it, and then dumping it straight into the surface water at a rate of, um, at, at a minimum of 650 gallons, 650 million gallons per year. And that's, of course, flowing into that Van Etten Lake there, down to the Van Etten Creek, also through the Osama River, and all out of the Lake Huron. As you can see, because of the geology of the area, it's actually going underneath the water systems, which is not typical, and that's because of the paleological uh, water flows. When this was a glacier area, it used to be a very large delta, so there are a lot of riverbeds underneath that are just going all over the place. Um, that impacts about, uh, well, at least 200 private wells. Uh, does not impact our municipal system because that's actually drawn 20 miles south. But we are concerned that eventually all this pouring out into Lake Huron could start having an effect on not just our community, but other communities that draw out from Lake Huron. As far as the action we're taking, we've been trying to be a voice for our people. We're trying to work with legislators, the Air Force, the DEQ, um, keeping in the loop of everything going on, uh, trying to plan municipal water extension, saying, look, just give us some money here, Air Force, or whoever, hopefully the Air Force, so it's only a few million dollars. Let's get clean water to everybody. Um, our health department has been extremely supportive in this. Um, the problem is that our health department doesn't carry the authority of some other departments. Uh, the Air Force has been very slow to respond. They've been very slow to set up our RAP board. It was supposed to be set up six months ago. They're still working on that. The Air Force came and removed records out of the repository. They will not give those records back. Um, they kicked us out of meetings. Um, apparently, they didn't like some of the questions I asked. The MDEQ has been extremely slow to respond. Um, they have not been good at enforcing standards on the Air Force. Uh, they haven't been good at setting standards on the Air Force. Uh, the EPA, zero. So whatever your political things are on this, it doesn't matter to me, the EPA has been pretty much out of the picture anyway, which is sad. This affects thousands of people worldwide because when this base closed, a bunch of people dispersed. We have lots of tourists that come in here and they then drink the water and then they go back to their homes. They bring their kids there, their grandkids, whatever, they drink it, they go back home. So now we've got people everywhere contaminated just from Wordsmith. Uh, the positives are is that we do have legislators, our political side has been very active in this. Um, one of them passed a law, but the Air Force said we don't like the wording of it, so we're not going to do anything about it. Um, we do have, uh, like Congressman Dan Kildee, he's representing uh, here also, um, along with several others, but my time is up now. I'd like to say that um, we do have a two-prong thing here. I'm talking more on the government side for a local government. Cindy Ashbeck here has uh, been part of a group that deals with the health effects of all of this for the veterans and civilians that have, have drank this water.
Um, first off, I want to say that I'm a veteran of the Air Force, and I have been in the military for 20 years, my husband 23. We were both stationed at Portsmouth Air Force Base for six years. Um, this impacts me personally. I have three children with Hashimoto's disease. Um, I also have a husband that's been disabled since he was 25 years old, and we believe it's directly related to water contamination at Portsmouth. Um, our group, um, organized our group meaning we're not really a community on the ground we're a community of veterans and civilians and independents that were stationed at wordsmith so we're a virtual community because we're all over the world and um, the only way we can function is well, as of now is through the internet um, and phone so we're google Maps isn't big, for all, big enough for all 800 of us so we are limited to the facebook actually um, Um, in 2015, the DEQ came to Wordsmith and tested old hydrants that were um, at the base. Um, the catch basins inside old hydrants previously connected to the base water system have tested positive for high levels of PFCs. Sorry if my terminology is wrong. <laughs> Lake's discovery of evidence includes 20-year-old water samples. Old water samples were collected in 2015 from 22 hydrants plus an old water softener tank and an old water heater found in abandoned buildings on the former base. Out of 24 samples tested, 10 were positive for PFOA and PFOS at concentrations above the EPA threshold of 70 parts per trillion. One hydrant, number 54, tested at 7,400 parts per trillion for PFOS and PFOA over 100 times the EPA advisory level, for 175 at 4380 parts per trillion, and an old water heater at 5065 parts per trillion, at actually building 5065, tested at 960 parts per trillion. The Michigan Department of Environmental Quality examined 240 hydrants and found measurable water in 22. The recently collected stagnant water samples had sat untouched in catch basins outside the pipes that connect the hydrants to the mains. These catch basins are underground, but above the water table. We hope that the hydrant data would push for an epidemiological study at the former Portsmouth Air Force Base for the veterans, families, and civilians who have reported chronic health problems. We suspect the data is connected to chemical exposure and contaminated base water. In February of 2016, our group, um, which we call, we've called ourselves a few different things now, we're Veterans and Civilians Clean Water Alliance. Um, in February of 2016, <coughs> we drafted a letter in um, conjunction with the uh, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and we sent it to the ATSDR requesting, um, they reopened the 2001 public health assessment they did and we're requesting it for a feasibility study along with epidemiological studies. Um, we have contacted many attorneys to represent our group. I think I missed, I've talked to Mr. Beloit. Um, he probably doesn't remember me, but that's okay. Um, most of them told us they cannot help us. Um, we are currently working with an environmental attorney, not working, we're talking with him actually, of the plans says that he would argue the Ferris Doctrine and bring a case for medical monitoring for the Ascota, Michigan residents. Um, medical monitoring has never been upheld, I guess, in the state of Michigan. There's never been a case. We are waiting uh, a draft of a health questionnaire from the attorney. Numerous lawmakers have, contact, have been contacted in many states with either no response or the question, how many residents in my jurisdiction are affected? A question that at this point is unanswerable. One congressman, Dan Kildee, has been helping us. Um, actually, he sent, this week they're sending a, a congressional inquiry as to why the ATSDR has not um, answered us, which was five months ago. Um, and we wrote, wrote the letter. Christina Bush from Department of Health and Human Services helped us greatly. Um, she's here today, um, but she's been a wonderful help for us to try and get some 
answers. Um, we've enlisted the help of Erin Brockovich, and she has been helpful. Um, we've done just recently done a mass mailing this week um, to over 400 legislators in the United States. We've also re we, this is a repeat of the first one we've done, um, so that's gone out this week. And um, okay, go back. How do I go back? Okay. Okay. That's that's right. Okay, it's missing the slide. But um, the Michigan military families and civilians exposed. Um, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality Site Manager Bob Delaney ordered the testing of the water samples collected from the Elkhamans. According to Mr. Delaney, the results. Who is also here? The results of these tests are fairly solid evidence that based personnel, families, and civilians working on the base were unknowingly <coughs> drinking water contaminated with PFCs above the EPA advisory level. Um, I have to close now. And where to stand still right now and what we need most from you guys is your help. We need help in direction. We need help with resources. We need, we need your help. And you're the, this is the community right here that can help us and we're asking for help. So um, thank you. Thank you all so much for, sh for sharing your stories. Um, and um, and I, want, I want you all to stay in your seats now and just turn on the mics if they're not turned on in front of you. Um, because I'd like, to, I'd like to actually take some time now to hone in on um, some of the things that are shared about your experiences, some of the things that are different about your experiences, and, um, and what that means for how we all move forward together in a way to address the problem, um, the problem that your communities are facing and that is meaningful. So um, I, I have a few questions that I want to ask, and then we'll take some questions from other people in the room. Um, and so I'll, I'll kind of take my questions one by one. Feel free to kind of speak up, um, you know, whoever wants to speak to the question. Uh, if you don't all want to answer the question, that's okay. We'll just move through them um, in the order that makes sense. Um, and then we'll have some time for open Q&A before we wrap up the panel. Um, so my first question is, um, for anyone that is comfortable speaking um, in a deeper way about this, is in what ways have you personally seen the effects of the contamination on your mental and physical health, the health of your family, or the health of your community. Okay. Um, like I mentioned up there, um, my my family's been personally affected. Um, my husband has some wacky conditions: um, vasculitis, interstitial lung disease, um, idiopathic neuropathy, um, and it goes on. And my kids, um, it's really strange that all three of them have Hashimoto's disease. Um, and they have notes on their, their thyroids that are being watched. So, and, and myself, I'm not, I have my own problems, but when it impacts you that much, when it impacts your family, you become deeply involved and you want to see things happen for us to get help. Not only help, but, you know, we have hundreds of families once we formed this group, contacting us, saying, you know, we have this going on in our life, and we need your help. And, you know, sometimes we, we can't give answers because we're just, we just started this a year ago. So we're very, we're baby in, in, the, in the process of learning. It was a crash course in chemicals for me, gosh. Um, but, yeah, it's... I'm so sorry. I know everyone has their, their stuff, but that's a lot. That's a lot of complaint. Um, I'm Joanne from the Monster site, and um, I I'm not you know for, for the Warminster whole area. You know we we can't take the PFAS out. You know what we were exposed to was a bunch of stuff. So I understand that that's really hard. It's really hard for us to do an epidemiology study and get like, specific. I I respect that. Um, but there's so many unanswered questions, there's so many sick people. Um, you asked about personally what, what I felt happened to me. Um, and it speaks of the science that was, that was discussed earlier today, some of the things that are, that are coming out. I feel that um, 
Uh, my, when my son was six years old, my oldest son, he was diagnosed with a cancerous brain tumor. I'm sorry, I think I said. And when the toxicology report came out, um, they said, you know, we found embryonic tissue in the center of the core, in, in, the, in the core of the tumor. So they asked a lot of environmental questions. Where do you live? Where do you work? Things like that. Um, and I never thought back to, you know, he's six years old, my early pregnancy. Where, where were you pregnant? That didn't really hit me until some of these new emerging uh, contaminants came out. And you hear about, you know, that it crosses the placenta, that it causes second generation health effects. Um, and especially these persistent bioaccumulative toxic chemicals that you can, you do the math in your head of the half-life. So if you grew up for 25 years of your life drinking water that you did not know was contaminated, and you were exposed to all kinds of other, you know, benzene and other, every chemical class there was, heavy metals, unbeknownst to you, you can't help but wonder, right? So when the, in, in 2012, 2013, when we found out about it, I started researching more, and I had seen some of, um, Dr. Linda, wherever your, your earlier studies. Uh, so I was aware of, of a lot that many people around were, and I kept thinking about that. Kept thinking, my gosh, um, across the placenta, I was pregnant. I was drinking the water while I was pregnant. They're, they're, they said that it started during, during pregnancy. So I, I do think it has second generation health effects. Well, within a few years later, the girl who lives four, years, four houses down growing up from me, had some with the brain tumor, who also had embryonic tissue in the, in the center of the tumor. Three years after that, the boy directly across the street from me had a son who had a brain tumor and had the same classification of brain tumor. So people will say, well, it's not that, maybe it was the monochloride, maybe it was something else, but how do you know? How do you ever know what the combined and cumulative effect of all these things that we were exposed to can do to you? You know, and there's just, um, you want answers, not, I'm not sure we'll ever get answers. Um, but um, Hope and I, I think the reason that we're here, we're advocating, we're trying to get answers and get it cleaned up is we don't want to see another community have to go through this. You know, we don't want to have to see another family suffer or have questions that are unanswered. So however you can learn from us, whether, um, however, a study could be done retrospectively or whatever, um, we would be you know, very supportive um, in helping. Thank you. Does anyone else want to speak to this question? Um, I think that this situation has caused a significant amount of stress and anxiety in my life and most people that have gotten to know me know that I don't sleep much so you probably see emails from me at 1 in the morning, 2 in the morning. Um, that's because I lose a lot of sleep over this. I worry about what's going to happen to my children. They're, they're healthy today, they're fine, but they were exposed to high levels of chemicals at a very early age in their life where their body is rapidly developing and I watch the slides of all the potential health effects and I just feel like as a mom I will never stop worrying about what these chemicals are going to do throughout the course of their life. It's not like once they hit 10 or 20 I'm going to sleep again. I'm always going to wonder how they're impacted and um, I try and take the stress and the anxiety and I really try and channel it through my advocacy work and through updating my Facebook page and collaborating with other communities because I feel like we can't undo what's been done, but we can learn from it, and we can absolutely um, prevent it from happening again. So I have tried to take the stress and the anxiety and channel it in a more positive and productive way. So I want to I want to pose another question. If if you want, if any of you want to continue answering the first question, you're welcome to. But um, but I'm I'm interested, and I think there are probably a lot of others in the room who are interested in hearing um, your perspective on how how you see your experience as different than that of people living in communities where the PFAS contamination comes from non-military sources, such as manufacturing sources. And um, you know, my sense is there are particular challenges uh, where you know when the responsible party is the military or the U.S. government in particular. And, and um, that are unique to these, you know, to your situations. And so I'd love to hear you speak specifically to that. Um, what I've seen is that on the military side of things, as opposed to coming from a place like DuPont or 3M, is that you can sue somebody that's a private company, but when it comes to the military, they can pretty much tell you no and you're stuck unless you can get the support from other areas. And of course, a lot of people say, well, politicians aren't involved in this, but 
you know, it'd be nice to say if you could just grab a couple politicians and make something happen, but that's not how our government works. We need all of them to make something happen to force the issue on it. Um, and so because there hasn't been that collaborative, that real strong, large collaborative effort in D.C., the DOD can still be in a position of saying, yeah, we're not going to do a whole lot about this. We're more concerned about some other things. Um, and so my comment to that is regarding the DOD being so slow to react to this and formulating a plan to just remediate things regardless of the EPA level is that this is the DOD committing chemical warfare on the American resident. I'd like to follow that with um, the same feeling of feeling like I lived in 9-11 except that, I mean, and I don't want to compare apples to apples because it wasn't, but we're looking at, I can look at our community and go back and probably 50% of the population is dead. I mean, we probably won't find people because people didn't know or people didn't, you know, they just didn't know. And, and also to have the, um, the government responsible or held accountable is to me, I mean, they've poisoned us and they haven't cleaned it up. I mean, my brother still owns our property and they've never, I mean, we, we are the base. The, the water came, and we had well water in our front lawn. We had a creek that came right from the base right into our front lawn, and we played in the, whatever, in the creek. We fell in the creek, we filled our pool, we, we drank it, we brushed our teeth in it, we made the Kool-Aid in it. I mean, as a child, and we, we talk about this growing up, I grew up in it, so I don't know what my health effects are gonna be. Even though I had cancer, I've had numerous odd tumors cut out of me, my sister has all these odd autoimmune diseases. Um, my father died at 52 from a brain tumor. The neighbor died at 53 from a brain tumor. All of our pets died of tumors. So there's just so many under, unanswered questions. And I feel loss, loss of loved ones, loss of safety. You know, safety that the government is able to do what they do. And I don't feel safe that they are protecting us. And I think that that's huge. And I. I really feel at a loss that there's nothing that can be done that the government's doing. I shouldn't say that. And I'm here to be an advocate and to fight for our children and fight for our grandchildren and to keep or get things better and then learn from our mistakes. But I do feel at a loss that there is no accountability. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most frustrating <coughs> things for me has been um, how fine-tuned, I guess, the whole marketing arm of the military is. I mean, they are so good at looking good. Um, and, and they're so good at uh, winning over the public. Um, and one of the things that happened to Peterson Air Force Base, and they, they actually had a, a press release I mean, a press conference. Most of their press conferences have been closed to the public, which has been frustrating. Um, also, technical meetings that the state health department was um, calling together, facilitating between the water districts and the EPA and the Air Force just to try to do some better ID and problem solving around it. What are we going to do? What's the problem? And how are we going to address it? The, I was originally invited to those because we didn't, the farm didn't quite fit into a private residence, nor did we fit into, um, you know, public water. We were somewhere in between. But then, you know, I felt like I was the only one asking, you know, some pretty challenging questions. So by the third meeting, they had called my boss and said, well, you need to reel her in, and she's not invited to these meetings anymore. So that, that, that was really difficult. Um, so, and then they keep promising to um, have, be more transparent. But th that hasn't been happening, and then even as just May, the journalists in, in town, um, they, were, they said, we're no longer going to answer your questions, we're going to refer you all to, you know, Texas. So, you know, those are just a couple of thoughts on that. Um, so I, wanna, I wanted to ask one final question, and I'll take some Q&A from the, from the room. Um, and I know that many of you have really spoken in specific terms about what you've, what you've lost because of this contamination in your community. 
Um, and if there's, you know, I'd be interested in hearing if there's more to say about that. And also, if there's anything that you gained from the process of going through this experience, if there's, and you know, if it's possible to have gained anything, um, I, you know, I'd be really interested in hearing about that as well. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I gained a lot. I'll have to say, um, I now have such a respect for the environment, mm -hmm. such a respect for the environment, and how it is so connected to our health. Um, I'd like to thank Ken Cook. I don't know if he's still here or not, um, but he uh, his organization has just done an incredible job. Um, and if you've, ne if you've never watched a video before, it's well worth your time to Google um, the 10 Americans. Um, that the environmental work group did. Because um, you will, in eight minutes, have respect for health and the environment. So that's one thing that I've learned. And I also have an appreciation for politics. Um, as much as I hate it, I realize that that's where meaningful change comes about, um, is changing our laws, and that we have to have sh stricter um, chemical regulations in this country. And task reform is a step in the right direction, but it is far from enough, and we deserve better. the gain because I just did the loss and I might as well I do have gained I've gained knowledge I've gained experience education and the biggest thing I've learned is, is you have to be an advocate for yourself and I know that we're all here being advocates and we've been told keep going keep going and I'm gonna keep going so I think that every single one of us needs to step up and gain a friend and plunge forward and, and really try to understand and be an advocate for yourself and your environment Um, okay, so I think we have we have almost 15 minutes. We have a little over 10 minutes left, and I wanted to just open it up to see if there are other specific <coughs> questions that people have around the room. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, great. Super impressed with all of the work that you've done in your communities, and um, I just want to pick up on something the supervisor said and suggested as a challenge to all of us. I think it's very achievable, but. We each have Congress people, we each have senators representing us in the federal government, and just in this room, that map that was displayed up in the fourth floor, got several states represented right here. And I think the principles are fairly simple and could be expressed clearly, you know, health studies, medical monitoring, health coverage costs, cleanups, um, filtration and alternative water supplies. We put them on paper, we get all of these reps to hear your voices as one, and that can start to move things. And we can bring that back home to your town boards, to your county, to your state reps, and we can move this. I think this this gathering here is super valuable, and I would challenge us to, to make, make that happen as an outcome here. Hi, I have a question for Hope and Joanne. Your last slide had concerns or had a list of concerns or something like that. And I couldn't quite see what they were. Could you? That's because we went to Catholic school and as soon as that buzzer went off, we just stopped. I know, I went to Catholic school too. Sorry. We follow the rules. <laughs> I had that slide right here. Um, we obviously said we need help in organizing efforts. We, we, we would like some type of blood testing program. There's been absolutely no blood testing programs. Um, we are not, we have no formal community assistance panel. And I know you know he asked her to do that, and we can do it ourselves. Um, we also, uh, our community seems um, unaware which is amazing, because our media person is absolutely incredible, absolutely incredible. Um, so how you cannot, I guess the younger, no one's reading the paper anymore, and, and, and it's online. Um, so we need ways to help inform the community of the seriousness and the impact and the extent of the problem. Um, we're also hopefully that we can collaborate with Peace, maybe on um, inclusion to possible some of the larger military studies. Um, did I answer your question or do you? Yeah, that's great, thank you. Yeah, that's really, you know. 
Um, I personally would like to advocate for continued research on you know, children's exposures and second generation health effects. Great, so we do have time for more questions. Right. And we have staff going around the microphone, so yeah. Um, well, I have <laughs> first a statement and then a, a question. Um, the, first of all, I, you know, I hear all the time that these uh, health studies are just so hard. As I always say, it's hard to get to the moon. It's hard to win World War II. It is not hard to do a health study. It's just expensive. And I think that we just need the will to do it. We don't need anything else. It's simply the will. And I think you're really at the grassroots and what you're doing is the only thing that's going to cause that to happen. Um, then the uh, second thing is why Westminster it seems like a sophisticated area of the country. And why do you think it's so... Blase. Uh, it's just. <coughs> yeah, I I would say that um, the site. I just think that the site closed in 1996. Um, one of the sites. One of the sites, and Warminster Willow Grove is still open. Um, and I believe that there are, there are many people that relocated, moved, um, just relocated, grew up, moved away. So the people like us who are still in the immediate area aren't aren't existing. And a lot of people still don't know. I get calls, I know somebody else mentioned it, Facebook messages, emails, oh, my sister got sick, can you help me? Oh my, I mean, probably once a week I get a Facebook inbox, oh my gosh, I need help, I need help. I have no way to help them. But I think that our area, either whether they're uneducated or their fear, I think fear is a huge part of it. And I think people who don't have the, you know, the oomph to push forward or, you know, just think it's no big deal. It's a, it's a multiple things, I believe. Also, I think that it's because um, a lot of the health effects that you see, at least the lawsuit ones, you know, if you don't fit into this category, kind of like we don't really care. So people will say, well, I, I didn't make the list, therefore what's wrong with me has absolutely no association with anything going on, which is semi-uneducated. But that's how they feel. So I was thrilled to see Dr. Clapp, the, the slides that you brought up from that smaller area that included breast cancer and included I think ovarian cancer and included brain, brain cancer. Yay. So, um, you know, we're making progress, but that's the best I can answer. I don't know why. I think we have time for just one or two more questions. Thank you so much. That's just an amazing uh, set of testimonies about you know, what, what can be done uh, with, with this issue. I wonder if, it, again, you're all working with military base uh, pollution. Um, when you um, think about uh, the alliances that have, have occurred in a couple of places between veterans and civilians, um, do you have a sense that that might be an effective strategy? Because, in particular, for, for many political issues in the United States, if you show that Americans are treating their veterans poorly, you, you get much more political leverage than if you say you've treated even children poorly. So, uh, that and the idea that a lot of veterans, particular officers, are sort of empowered to say, you know, no, you can't do that. or uh, I, I know how to take care of business, and to, to really get that those alliances going, is that something that you all feel like, even though you've found a lot of resistance from the official military, that those people who were uh, content, drinking contaminated water while they were in service, um, have you been able to find some alliance with them? Oh. I was going to say, on my side of things, the answer to that is no. Um, I know that there's a lot of active duty who are very concerned, um, but the Air Force, or I have to say the military in general, kind of suppresses those things. It's about, um, um, it's, I can't speak on this on the Air Force side of things, the Air Force is very image-centric. Um, but the Air Force I was a part of, um, they were about doing things and doing it right. Um, I, in this process, I've seen the higher level just right under the Secretary of Defense, or right Secretary of Air Force, that that's a whole different game for them. This is, this is the ugly side that mm -hmm. I'd never seen while I was active. Um, and I wish there was that connection, that there were people who transferred, especially officers, into another position who could provide the help. <coughs> but uh, they're, they're just not given that leverage or the resources to do that. If I understand your question right, I think eventually, once we have the ability to meet with a group, um, in, in our case, civilians and um, veterans sit down, <coughs> that's ever going to happen. Um, I think that there, 
that will be helpful for us to align with each other. And that's what we're trying to do. In, in um, our area, in Willow Grove and, and um, Warminster, they are actually totally separate, which is blows me away as a civilian person. Um, the military has their own Facebook page. They want all their own stuff. So they really work hard at keeping us separate, which is unbelievable to me, because I believe we're fighting the same fight. Um, I mean, there's probably two or 3,000 people on the military. There's two or 3,000 on our Facebook page, but there's fights between and fights on the page. It's just, it's unfortunate, but I'm not sure why. But in our area, I feel like they're separated at this point. Yeah, I think the only way that the military is really going to take action on this without the political pressure is if the DOD makes environment a uh, metric that's used to promote people. So I think we have one more question. Hi. Um, thank you all, and I'm like you all. I've been impacted by the environment in which my family lived. And it's unfortunate that we have to spend so many years fighting um, but anyways, I have a couple of questions that came to mind that I often hear about. And I work specifically with dioxin and PCBs, but I'm curious your experiences. Um, Susan, with produce and the testing, I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. And because residents are always asking me, where can we get it tested? You know, we crave more information on that topic. And then um, also I've heard groundwater wells mentioned many times. So I'm going to go out on a limb and assume you have septic systems as well. A common question I receive from community members is, are our yards safe from the area where they have an aerating septic system that sprays out over the land? Um, and maybe if you guys have any experience with that type of contamination as well. Uh, well, to this day, I will stand my, by my contention that my safe is my food is safe. It's safer than anything you'll get in the grocery store because I can tell you exactly what I have not put on it, and you have no clue what's on the stuff in the grocery store. But anyway, as far as more objective test results, um, so we used the lab in Canada because they were they I was told they were the only lab that was set up to actually test uh, produce and meat. And I also sent eggs and goat's milk. Um, and as far as the pro and it costs a lot of money. <laughs> and as far as the produce, um, it came back, and I can't, there's just so many, I don't even remember what the detection limits were, but everything, and they tested for, I believe, 13 different compounds. And um, most everything was undetected with the exception of pumpkins, and we're a big pumpkin farm, so that's problematic, and potatoes. But even those tested well below the screening level that um, the state health department finally gave me for produce. And then the meat, I got a very vague response from the USDA lab. They said, well, yeah, there's really nothing in the blood that we can see, and the very minimal traces in the meat. Um, and the eggs was the one uh, that was a little was probably the highest, and I think that's consistent with um, the, the get it goes with fat or protein or whatever. <laughs> so, uh, no, it it has more to do with the chemical makeup of the egg, right? <laughs> I don't quite understand that, but um, yeah, the protein. Yeah, so, and then the School of Mines, they tested our water and soil. They did a lot of soil samples, water samples. They said our soil was uh, a little bit above background levels, but not near what they're seeing at, and on industrial farm sites where these spiral solids are being spread. Um, so, um, and then they did some modeling based on research they had done about how plants take up these contaminants or whether they take them up. They did some modeling that will then, it's supposed to help us project as the concentration levels change in the water and the soil, what that will mean in terms of the produce in the future. So we really, um, we really only have one more minute, but, and I wondered um, if any of you want to share any closing messages, a score <laughs> message, either to the people in the room, to communities going through similar 
challenges uh, or to the general public? <coughs> I would like to say that um, the ideal situation is for people to come up with solutions, present those to the politicians, and let them run with that solution. Um, they cannot develop it on their own. Um, they're very limited staff. Um, they have thousands of other things going on. So help them move along. I've had a lot of help from my community, retired EPA members, the water civilian or uh, Vets and Civilian Water Alliance has been a huge help to me, and that collaboration is what's making a much more significant difference. I think just in being here, it's awesome. Thanks to everybody who, show, who showed up, put their time and effort in, and this is just the beginning. I guess kind of on a more reflective philosophical note, I guess this has really forced me, well a lot of things forced me because I also went to Catholic school so I, it doesn't take much to make me feel guilty but um, to really, I mean this is, it's a, this is a much bigger thing that just, than just some contaminated water and I think it has so much to do with our, the lifestyle that we've become accustomed to and so to really like ask ourselves some tough questions about what we really need and what we don't need and what's the cost of convenience and um, all that big stuff. So thanks. I think for me it's just that this is part of, you know, like you said, a bigger <coughs> issue and it's impacted millions of people. It's a worldwide <laughs> issue and I think we're scratching the tip of the iceberg but we have to keep going, you know, and I think we need to see more efforts with research, we need more legislative efforts, and we need to streamline our approach. I think at the end of the day, we all have the same goals. We want to be safe, we want to drink safe water, we don't want our families to get sick, and we just need to all work together. So thank you all for being here and being part of this process. So I, I think we need to close. I want to thank all of you for sharing your stories and for your courageous activism and advocacy. Um, and I think we're actually taking a break now. All right.